Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lammers. I am the chair of the Democrats Abroad Taxation Task Force. We are really excited to welcome Congressman Donald Byer to this event to talk about the new uh, simplified filing for Americans Abroad bill. Before we get started, I just wanted to explain some of the ground rules for this webinar. Uh, we have disabled the chat box simply because we're expecting hundreds of attendees, and in order to streamline the webinar, uh, we've just enabled it for moderators to share links. That said, we are going to have a particular section for uh, Q&A during the event, so if you do have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A box, and we will then get to your question. We will get to as many as we can. However, we have a tight uh, schedule, so I do recommend that if you see a question in the Q&A box that you want to see answered first, then upvote for that question. That will help us get to the questions that people want to hear uh, answers to the most. So I hope that helps clarify, and um, again, welcome for uh, attending the webinar. Uh, again, I see that there's more people coming in. So um, my name is Rebecca Lammers. I am the chair of the Democrats Broad Taxation Task Force. We're really honored to welcome Congressman Beyer uh, to this webinar in order to talk about the tax simplification for Americans Abroad bill that has recently been introduced. I'm just going to uh, do some introductions and kind of uh, go into a little bit of detail before we get started and we welcome the Congressman. Um, so before we get started, I need to read this disclaimer. Democrats abroad cannot provide individual tax advice. Advice requires consideration of your individual circumstances and needs, none of which can be done at this event. We are not tax lawyers, accountants, or advisors. Please consult a professional tax advisor, accountant, return preparer when addressing your personal tax matters. Democrats abroad does not endorse or recommend companies or individuals attending or hosting this event. The views expressed at the event are those of the respective individuals or companies, not Democrats abroad. No liability is accepted by Democrats abroad for the opinions expressed or for any errors or admissions expressed about matters of tax in any country, your financial planning, or your legal obligations. If you are in need of tax advice, you can consult the IRS tax return preparer directory to find an advisor or tax return preparer near you or providing online services to meet your needs and budget, though buyers need always beware. So, um... With that, I also want to remind everybody to please fill in the feedback form. Uh, we host a number of different events, and it's always really critical that we get your feedback on um, what you thought of the event so that we can prove on future events. So please don't forget to fill in the feedback form at the end of the event. So just to highlight, um, I'm just going to do a kind of quick run through uh, of uh, kind of the state of play with our tax advocacy work, and uh, then we will uh, welcome Congressman Beyer, and we will uh, have a little bit of a Q&A with him, and then uh, to wrap it up, I'm going to walk you all through on how to contact your members of Congress in order to ask that they support and co-sponsor the, uh, the bill. So with that, just a, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, I am the chair of the Democrats Abroad Taxation Task Force. I'm actually a volunteer. I've been volunteering for Democrats Abroad since 2017. Um, I am also the international member of the Taxpayer Advocacy Panel. Uh, if you've not heard of the Taxpayer Advocacy Panel before, I'm going to explain a little bit more about that here in a little bit as well. So uh, I'm just like you. Um, I'm like majority of Democrats abroad members. I am a long term resident overseas. I am originally from Ohio and I've lived in London for 17 years. I'm a small business owner uh, and I'm not an accountant. <laughs> I do not have a tax background. Um, basically, the reason why I started volunteering for Democrats abroad was because I got really frustrated about my personal tax situation. It was basically next to impossible to find uh, an accountant or anybody that could answer my questions on what I should be doing to file my taxes correctly, and I found it very frustrating. And so through my journey of trying to figure things out, I've been able to understand and recognize the problems that Americans abroad face. Um, a lot of it is legislative, um, but also some of it is not. And so this is what has kind of led me down this path to uh, get involved in uh, American abroad tax advocacy work. 
So a little bit more about the Democrats Abroad Taxation Task Force. We're basically a group of about um, 80 volunteers all over the world, uh, all Democrats Abroad members who really care about changing the tax problems and addressing them and fixing them for Americans abroad. We advocate for a switch to residency-based taxation. I'll get into that more in a little bit. Um, eliminating FATCA reporting of foreign accounts for Americans abroad. Uh, an exemption of the uh, American business owner, an exemption for American business owners living abroad from the guilty and the transition tax. And also um, you can read more about our tax advocacy work on our blog. What, what do we do for you in general? Um, so for example, one of the things that we did last year is we, we wrote the tax and financial access report on Americans abroad. Uh, we help with hosting tax and financial, edu uh, financial education events all over the world. We also submit formal statements for the record for congressional hearings or uh, when there's changes to regulations. Uh, we do candidate outreach and education when it's election time. We also go to Washington, D.C. to actually talk face to face with members of Congress, their staff, the IRS, Treasury, and other federal agencies, um, and also work very hard on raising awareness of our tax uh, uh, tax issues um, in the press. So for example, we recently have had some coverage in Forbes, in the New York Times, and um, some other uh, articles through op-eds and, and things like that. So uh, we also have, uh, over the course of this year and, and more recently submitted some formal submissions and uh, are currently in the process of uh, writing our formal submission for the consular renunciation fee uh, that's open with the State Department. Um, for those of you that um, may not be aware of the report that we put out last year, um, we did a survey of Americans abroad on the tax and financial access issues that they experience. We had nearly 7,000 people respond to the survey, so it was a significant number of people. And uh, we then compiled the uh, results and um, uh, summarized them in this report. Once I'm comfortable now suffocating a 2022 update on tax and financial access issues of Americans abroad. Um, so you can actually go and download the report for free. Um, you can also check out, uh, we had a lot of different graphics and um, summaries of the data that you can look in um, graphic form on the website. If you have not read this report, I would really strongly advise that you do. Um, we often get emails from Americans abroad saying, I don't understand why my bank account has been closed, or I don't understand why I have to file a U.S. tax return when I don't owe any U.S. tax, or I, you know, I, I don't understand why I can't open an investment account. Like all of those kinds of questions that you may have, they're all addressed in this report because these are all systemic issues and problems that are experienced by Americans brought at large, not just by you individually. And, and a lot of the feedback I got from people who have read this report is that they've realized that they're not alone. They've realized that these are wider issues and they are being addressed. So I would really recommend that you read the report. So busting some myths here, just kind of taking a step back in terms of the basics of what it's like to file as an American abroad uh, a U.S. tax return. Um, the way it works is Americans abroad first file their tax declarations and are liable to pay tax in their country of residence and then are required to file a U.S. tax return. So basically the U.S. tax return is required because um, we have a, what's called a citizenship-based tax system. And so Americans are liable for U.S. taxation regardless of where they live in the world, regardless of however long they've lived abroad, and regardless of whether they've lived in the United States or not. If, if you are a U.S. citizen, whether you are a dual citizen, and regardless of your age, you are required to file a U.S. tax return if you meet the filing requirements. So this is a huge um, difficulty at, that a lot of people face in terms of understanding um, because this is quite unique compared to other countries around the world. 
Um, from our statistics and information that we've gathered, half of Democrats abroad members live in countries where the income tax is actually higher than in the U.S. So majority of people who are filing a U.S. tax return who live abroad don't actually end up owing any U.S. tax. However, the, requir the, the requirement to file a U.S. tax return still exists. And a few of the common expat tax forms are listed on the screen here, but I just wanted to kind of point out here that some of these forms require at least, uh, the IRS estimated time burden in order to complete these forms are over 50 hours. And, and this is just um, very burdensome and very difficult for everyday Americans abroad to figure out how to file. Um, and so they have to pay an accountant to do it for them. And a lot of people feel that that's very unfair for them to have to file, even if no taxes do, um, in order to prove that they owe no U.S. tax. So these kind of forms are very burdensome and cumbersome and difficult for people to use, but they are for common uh, retirement accounts or savings accounts or, or things like that um, that are common for Americans abroad, but are foreign from a U.S. perspective. Um, so I get this question a lot. Why isn't the U.S. like the rest of the world? Um, basically, as I just said, it's based on our citizenship. Um, and it dates back to a time when the U.S. taxes were actually higher than the rest of the world. But today, most Americans abroad, we're not rich. We're actually pretty average uh, when you look at the statistics. Um, we tend to have we tend to live in a higher tax jurisdiction than the US and we also suffer from outdated stereotypes that we're all rich and we're fleeing the country to evade taxes um we we know that that is i think everybody on this webinar knows that that's not true um and most people move abroad for family work or school um and congress doesn't really think about us um when they're drafting legislation and um Part of this is because they don't hear from us. It's it's partially difficult for people to actually contact their members of Congress. Um, so if they don't hear from us, how do they know that there is a problem? And so there's this ongoing issue where um, they're, they're not hearing from us. And so they don't know there's a problem and they don't think about us when legislation is being drafted. And so they're continuously ongoing what are called unintended consequences, which it wasn't intentionally um, to harm Americans abroad, but we have happened to be collateral damage in, in certain circumstances. So, but we're trying to change that. That is what our work in tax advocacy is all about. Um, I also wanted to highlight that there are discrepancies between the kind of state support that Americans get with filing their taxes compared to Americans abroad. So um, there used to be what are called tax attaches. Um, so they were basically places where Americans abroad could go to get help to file their taxes. But those were shut down in 2015 due to funding being pulled. Um, there are also no taxpayer assistance centers for Americans abroad. So that uh, there are taxpayer assistance centers um, that are from the IRS all over the country in every state. Um, Americans abroad don't have those, so we can't receive face-to-face -face help. There are also local taxpayer advocates in Puerto Rico and Hawaii that are supposed to help international taxpayers, um, but these aren't local or necessarily open during waking hours for many of us. Um, there's no government funded low income or retiree tax prep services for, for people abroad. Um, and also the international phone line is not toll free for us. Um, we always, always have to pay something in order to call the IRS. Um, local embassies don't advertise support that's available for filing taxes. Um, so, sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And the IRS also recognizes um, international taxpayers as an underserved community. So they, they are aware that there it needs to be more support. Um, so I wanted to point out before we get into the kind of legislative side of things, there is actually some support that exists for Americans abroad in terms of filing their taxes. Um, one of them is the Taxpayer Advocacy Panel. So uh, this panel is actually a federal advisory committee that was 
established under uh, the Department of Treasury. Um, it's basically a group of volunteers, at least one person per state, um, including one international member of, uh, and uh, basically I am your international member on the taxpayer advocacy panel. And essentially what we do is we submit issues and recommendations in order to improve customer service and communications with the IRS. So, and the IRS has made a commitment to listen to those ideas from the taxpayer advocacy panel. So if you have any ideas or suggestions to improve customer service or communications with the IRS, I would love to hear your, your ideas. You can send me an email. Uh, my email is on the screen. Um, you can also submit it directly to improveirs.org. The other area that a lot of Americans abroad don't know about that uh, support that's available is the Taxpayer Advocate Service. So basically the Taxpayer Advocate Service assists taxpayers to resolve tax problems with the IRS. So for example, if you've gotten a letter and it says you owe tax and or a penalty and you know that you don't, or if you're having problems communicating, then um, they can step in and uh, open up a case on your behalf and liaise with the IRS directly to get the problem resolved. Um, so if you'd like to know more information, there's links on the screen. I've also been working with the Taxpayer Advocate Service to offer what are called online problem solving days. So um, I will be offering those in an online Zoom just like this um, in the future next year, especially. So I'm gonna just kind of summarize the uh, the bill, kind of taking a sidestep here to address the legislative issues that um, we're hoping we'll be able to address a lot of the tax problems that Americans abroad face. So one of them is for HR 5432, uh, which is the Americans Abroad Simplified Filing Act introduced by Congressman Beyer last month. Um, basically what this bill would do is it would create a simplified tax return to help uh, make it easier for Americans filing from abroad who owe no U.S. tax, which is the majority of us based on IRS statistics. Um, the second part of the bill eliminates double taxation for pensions, retirement distributions, including Social Security, um, scholarships, fellowship grants, um, disability benefits, child care expenses, and unemployment benefits. Um, and then the third part of the bill actually consolidates the FBAR into the FATCA. Um, it then increases the filing threshold. So for a, an individual filing, it would increase it um, from $10,000, which is the filing threshold for FBAR today, to increase it to 200,000, uh, which is the, uh, the FATCA filing threshold. And it also eliminates the requirement to report to FinCEN. I get a lot of emails from people saying, I don't know what the FBAR is. I just found out about it. Um, a lot of confusion abounds because people are having to submit an FBAR to FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Network. And they're like, I'm not a criminal. Why am I having to submit uh, this form to them? Like, it doesn't make sense for a lot of people to have to submit that to FinCEN as opposed to attaching it to their tax return. So this eliminates that problem so that it's attached to their annual tax return and also increases the filing threshold um, of uh, two, to up to two, about 200,000. So um, I think, um, I'm not sure if uh, Congressman I'm, I'm assuming Congressman Byer is here. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, I'm going to, yeah, I can see he's here. Hi, hi, Congressman. I'm just Hello. gonna read your short bio here and then I'll, I'll introduce you. <laughs> um, so uh, we're again, we're very honored to have uh, Congressman Don Byer here. Um, he is currently serving his fifth term as the U.S. Representative from Virginia's 8th District. Um, he serves on Congress's Joint Economic Committee and also serves on the House Committee on Ways and Means. President Obama nominated um, Representative Byer to serve as ambassador to Switzerland in Liechtenstein in 2009. And as ambassador, he learned firsthand of the tax and financial access issues faced by Americans abroad. This is what has led him to introduce H.R. 5432, the Tax Simplification for Americans Abroad Act, which we're honored to speak with him about in more detail today. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you now. Um, we'd love to hear more about the bill and um, also any kind of on the ground updates of what's going on in, in Congress today as well. 
Rebecca, thank you very much. And uh, you have done such an excellent job these last couple of minutes explaining everything. Um, I don't know. I have much more to add, but I, I will do my best. And thank, and you. thank you all for, for being a part of this, paying attention to this really important issue that gets very little, tragically little attention in Washington, D.C. and in Congress. Uh, a quick story, real life. Um, I, I worked full time for two years on the Obama campaign. Um, I led the Mid-Atlantic Finance team, not because I wanted to be ambassador, but you know, because I, I wanted this transformational figure in, in our in our government, in our in our country. Um, and I honestly thought that I, maybe I could be a deputy assistant undersecretary of something at the Department of Commerce and was stunned when uh, after a few weeks after the inauguration, White House personnel called up and asked me if I wanted to go to Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Of course, we were delighted, completely surprised. And I spent the next you know, many months, I think I did 65 one-on-ones with various people at Defense Department, CIA, Department of Treasury, Commerce, et cetera. But at the very end, I met with the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs um, for half an hour. It took weeks to get on his schedule. And when I sat with him, I said, you know, what do you expect of me? You know, what's, what's my number one job? And he said to overcome the anti-American sentiment in Switzerland, which was apparently very strong because of you know, the two wars in Abu Ghraib and our environmental policies, uh, et cetera. So we go to Switzerland, uh, August 6th, I think, of 2009. And about six months later, and things were rolling along fine. And we hold a town hall meeting in Geneva for the American citizens, the American expats living in Geneva and surrounding areas. Um, I've been in and out of politics, you know, either as a candidate or helping other people for 40 years. That was the most brutal session I've ever had. I've never had a town hall meeting or a debate or, or anything that was as difficult as that was. Um, I, I did it with the U.S. permanent rep to the United Nations, um, Betty King, and she fled halfway through. <laughs> and we discovered that the source of the anti-American hostility in Switzerland was among the American expats who lived in Switzerland. And it was, all had to do with the things that Rebecca was just talking about uh, so very well, so very clearly. Um, while I was there, I first got there, it turned out, that we had a two-year wait for citizen renunciations. And our consular affairs office was sending them to Vienna, Austria, or, or Berlin um, to get the renunciations because we were so far behind. Well, um, I, I cleaned that up. You know, we, right away we said we need to do this in one week or two weeks, not two years. It took about six months to catch up with just a lot of focus. But what that then meant was that a uh, little Switzerland with 8 million people, 40,000 from uh, Americans living in there, um, led the nation, uh, led the world in American renunciations for the next three years. Uh, again, completely driven by the way the U.S. government treats our citizens who live overseas. And, you know, I, again, Rebecca said it well, oh, we're only two countries in the world that utilize a citizenship-based tax system. Uh, the other one is Eritrea, uh, not exactly a role model. By the way, their tech structure is much, much lower, more generous uh, than ours is. And this places a uniquely heavy burden on you, on the Americans living overseas. We got to meet your tax obligations to the U.S. and the country of residence. But even worse, understanding all the complex interactions between both systems and how the various tax credits, deductions, exclusions apply to their specific situations. And i tell you, some of the most difficult consular affairs issues we had were just about this double taxation um, system. One of the saddest was a, a mother in Geneva with a daughter born with a number of really serious intellectual and physical disabilities, um, in, including um, never able to be verbal, um, you know, just very, very low IQ. Um, before they really realized that, they had gone and registered as an American citizen at the embassy in Bern. So now she's in her, she, when I was there, she was in her 20s and having to fill out a tax return um, every year um, it, it, the cost in Geneva of about $6,000 per return um, for no income. Um, but she she was apparently the, the, uh, the recipient of a trust in her name that her parents had established for her. So we tried to renounce her citizenship, and turns out that um, 
you cannot use a surrogate, even a guardian, even a, tr a trustee, um, e even you know a, a parent of an extremely disabled child or adult. It has to be done by that person herself or himself with a willing knowledge. Well, obviously, that was never happening. And uh, we protested all the way to the Supreme Court, who pointed out two different uh, Situ uh, Supreme Court rulings, once again, affirming that that person could not renounce her citizenship. Just crazy stuff, uh, things that made no sense at all. And I'm thrilled about the resources provided by the, by the Internal Revenue Service, but they're insufficient. Uh, I would say we did uh, my little congressional district, which is inside the Beltway, Northern Virginia. We did a um, hundred uh, it was a crazy 3,600 individual cases last year of citizens coming to us and a, a plurality were about the IRS. So we're very close to the IRS taxpayer assistance, but uh, almost none of them had to do with uh, FATCA or FBAR or the foreign earned income exclusion or the foreign tax credit. So this is just a lot of the challenges. We found that at least anecdotally, FATCA was one of the primary causes of divorce in Switzerland, um, as uh, American wives or American husbands didn't want the U.S. government getting involved in their spouse's business. And uh, I know I lost my Credit Suisse bank account the moment I left the country because there was no way they were going to let a Virginian have that. Um, and in our justifiable attempt to curb tax evasion by high-income individuals living overseas, we have swept up millions of ordinary Americans in a tax system that is unresponsive at best and actively harmful at worst. Since coming to Congress, I have, first with Carolyn Maloney from New York and Joe Wilson from, from South Carolina, you know, bipartisan Democrats and Republicans, try to elevate and amplify the concerns faced by Americans living overseas. And um, after much hand-waving, I made it under the Ways and Means Committee after two sessions, uh, the perfect place to be to actually make a difference on these things. By the way, my first choice um, in the five years of Ways has, has always been the tax subcommittee, uh, which again is where these changes are going to take place. So to the, to the immediate, the Tax Simplification for Americans Abroad Act is one of those solutions. We introduced this in the last Congress. At that time, I, I was pleased to have as my principal co-sponsor, um, Mike Kelly, who is a Republican from Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm a Democrat from Virginia. And Mike and I worked together on this and didn't make a lot of progress. Um, we got a lot of people to sign up for it, but we couldn't get it through House leadership to the floor. Um, I was thrilled then. I, I wasn't thrilled that we lost the House. And you know, I no longer got to be chair of the Joint Economic Committee and things like that. We didn't have Nancy Pelosi as our speaker. But I was thrilled that Mike Kelly got to be chair of the Tax Subcommittee on Ways and Means. I thought, this is perfect. So in early weeks, I went and sat with Mike and said, okay, it's time for us to do the tax simplification for Americans abroad again. And uh, he graciously waved me off and said, as chairman, he can't be or doesn't want to be the lead on bills that come before his committee. Um, I'm still at the moment working with two other um, tax subcommittee members, Republicans, uh, to do this with me. I'm very optimistic we'll get one of them um, because we really need ways and means to take that up this year. You know, you know what it does. In brief, it calls on the IRS to create a short form, a short form certification for Americans living abroad who have no taxability, tax liability and earn below $400,000. So it's going to make an enormous difference in the time and money needed for most of you, ordinary taxpayers, to comply with your tax obligations. I think Rebecca mentioned that more than half of the Americans overseas don't owe any money to the U.S. government because the tax rates in their countries are, are higher than ours and the like. Um, politics is the art of the possible. You know, We continue to push forward and, and get as much additional support for this proposal as we can and continue to educate the members of Congress and the members of Ways and Means Committee about what it's like to be an American living overseas and having to put up with the double taxation, um, all the issues on changes in currency valuation, FBAR, which um, the penalties that were under FBAR are among the most egregious and unfair I've ever seen, and then just FATCA. Uh, you, you, you know so much of this yourself because you've dealt with it. One of the Strange ironies 
is with FACA, we hold our citizens living overseas to a much higher standard than we hold our own corporations here in the United States. Uh, again, back 2011, 2012, um, somebody at the IRS had this cool idea to apply FATCA, FATCA light or FATCA equivalent to the banks in the United States. Uh, every member of the Florida delegation, Democrat, Republican, House and Senate signed a letter saying, if you do that, the banks in Miami will empty over a weekend. They will all go back to Brazil and Argentina and uh, all the other places um, where they're stashing their money in a safe American bank, as long as it didn't have to be disclosed. Um, so look, uh, we can only get done what we can get done. There are days I'd like to be the benevolent dictator for just a day <laughs> to do things like um, dramatically reform FBAR and FATCA to uh, pass our Americans Abroad Tax Reform Act to do a lot of other good things. In the meantime, we just have to hammer away at it, you know, one person at a time. Um, I ask you to be patient, not because I want you to have to be patient, but only because um, it often takes the right. Uh, by the way, um, you would, I served eight years in the Virginia Senate. Virginia has this wonderful provision in its constitution that every bill will only have one object, one subject, they call it object in the constitution, and that object will be reflect, reflected in the title of the bill. So in 60 days every year, we'd pass up to a thousand bills. In Congress, however, um, it's very difficult to pass a bill on its own. And the most likely way is it gets folded into something larger, you know, a tax extender act at the end of the, uh, of the year, uh, the omnibus appropriations, the uh, the huge Chips and Science Act, or you know, the, the I remember two years ago, Nancy Pelosi had flown back on a bill we signed. I think the day after Christmas, and I get to sign it. The thing, starting up from the floor, it was five thousand five hundred pages long. Um, our act is probably two pages long, and if we could somehow get to a point where we're dealing with things piece by piece. Um, it would be much faster. But in the meantime, we, we don't do it that way. So we have to find the very right legislative vehicle to attach the Americans Abroad Bill to. Um, and we, we continue to work on that really hard. Um, so I, I, I'd like to pause and take whatever questions uh, I can ask. I have a terrific um, staff person raised in Portugal and London School of Economics. So his dad was ambassador to Portugal. So he's lived overseas a lot. Um, and had a beautiful education to help me do, do all the necessary staff work to get this through. So uh, we are not giving up. Uh, I cling to the vision of getting rid of citizenship-based taxation. Uh, I don't think that, that this is what American exceptionalism should be uh, all about. Um, but uh, after nine years, I have a lot more power than I had eight years ago, but I'm hoping in a few years, I'll have even more ability to influence the outcome of this legislation. And I will continue to work for you, not just because I love you, but because it's the right thing to do. And I do understand the great dilemma that, that you live under. And with that, Rebecca, I'll yield back to you and take whatever questions are appropriate. Thank you, Congressman. Um, it's, it's really encouraging to hear um, I mean, on one hand, I, I understand all of the barriers um, and uh, difficulties in, in the 118th. Um, it's, it's been a difficult year. Um, maybe that's an understatement. Um, well, we, 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 don't, we don't even have a speaker at the moment. <laughs> I think it's just a day 18 or day 19 where we've done no work at all. Um, yeah, um, it, it's a real shame. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean that we don't keep trying, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, basically, we we have a few questions that uh, were submitted in advance, and so I'm I'm going to ask uh, some of the first ones and then uh, throw it to some of my colleagues here. Um, but the first one is uh, for for this bill. Clearly, it will help resolve uh, a lot of the issues for low and middle income Americans abroad. Uh, but some of the top questions that we regularly regularly receive um, are, why do Americans abroad have to file at all when we owe no U.S. tax? Uh, why not simply do what other countries do and excuse non-resident citizens from filing in the first place? Uh, yes, I heartily agree. And um, 
back to we do what we can do. You know, I, I have, I've never independently researched this, but I've been told a number of times that this overseas, you know, the, the citizenship-based taxation was an idea of a Harvard professor during the Kennedy regime. And it was slipped into one of those big, big bills uh, without a lot of comment. And that's why we are stuck with it. Just like FATCA, which was subject to virtually zero floor debate and was never part of a, of a hearing, um, was inserted in a, in a bigger bill back, uh, I don't know, was the Bush years um, or the Clinton years, uh, again, w without really any debate. But once it's in there, it's really hard to get it out. And and the the other dilemma, you know, we have a thirty three trillion dollar federal debt right now. Um, we did we were seven hundred billion last year. I think we're going to be one and a half trillion this year added to it. We have this huge mismatch between our tax revenues, which are fifteen to sixteen percent of our GDP, and our spending, which is about twenty two percent of our GDP. Um, this is there's lots of reasons behind it. That the biggest driver, of course, is is what they call mandatory spending, uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. They're now 80% of the federal budget. And at home, we don't tax ourselves enough to pay for what we also demand politically. Because I, I promise you, uh, all a political leader on, on either party has to do is say, I'm going to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, and they're, they're toast, their history. Um, so what that means, though, is that um, the the many fiscal conservatives on the Hill, when you introduce a bill that, that costs anything that reduces revenue, um, they it becomes just really difficult to pass. So we're gonna need to be in a better position in terms of our revenue expense balance in order to be able to go ahead and say, look, we need to get rid of citizenship-based taxation. It's wrong, it doesn't make any sense. By the way, when you apply that to corporations too, what it means is that we freeze um, untold billions of dollars and profits of American companies that can't come back to the United States to invest in our economy here without getting hit with really whopping uh, taxes. Um, although the taxes have already been paid in the country where where the money was earned. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess that, that kind of leads into um, why doesn't Congress support residency-based taxation, uh, you know, you, you you know that that's what the rest of the world ha has. Um, wh what do you think are the barriers to making residency-based taxation a reality in the tax code? Rebecca, one of the very first resistance is if you have 435 members of the U.S. House, I would be astonished if more than eight to 12 people knew that we had residency-based taxation. Uh, most are just clueless about it. And the ones that do know uh, either have been exposed to it from me, Carol Maloney, Joe Wilson, and others, or, or they're actually CPAs. Um, other than that, I, I, I'll, I'll do an experiment uh, on the floor tonight and ask the first 10 people I see if they know about it. And, and Rebecca, I'll report back to you. But I'm pretty confident it's going to be 0 for 10. So that's job number one. Uh, there's a bill um, that, again, should pass. Um, to create a, an independent commission to study the challenges of America's living abroad. Carolyn Maloney had been the lead on it for a number of years, but um, she, she left the Congress last time. Um, that would be a wonderful way to get a lot of attention, to have public hearings on it, congressional hearings, to get the word out to people. Um, but essentially, as with so many um, different caucuses, our primary ed job is education, is teaching people what the challenge really is. Because, you know, if you're back home in, in Arkansas or Kansas or Michigan, you're not hearing about this. And that's why. In fact, when I came to Switzerland summer 2009, I had very little insight, no insight into it. Um, and only by living overseas um, did I, you know, understand that this is a really important public policy issue to address. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean that that has been my experience coming to DC and speaking with legislators about these issues is that most of them just don't know that it's a problem. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to get more um, uh, Americans living abroad contacting their members of Congress about it. So I'm I'm going to go through that later um, on the Re webinar. Re Rebecca, one other piece of this too is the the 
unfair and incorrect assumption that Americans living abroad are uh, A, either all tax cheats, or B, they're wealthy people living in, in Monaco um, or you know, the, the French Riviera or someplace, when the reality is that you know, most Americans living overseas are middle income, um, you know, just normal Americans, you know, working and raising their kids and, and live overseas for a variety of reasons. One of the most damning statistics is of all the countries in, in the, um, the OECD, we are dead last in the percentage of Americans who live and work overseas. And may a little of that may be because it's wonderful to be in America, but having lived in other countries, uh, a lot of it is the way we treat our American citizens living overseas. You know, that if you're a big corporation, it's a whole lot easier to hire um, somebody, you know, European or South American or African to work and not have to deal with these other issues. 100%, yeah. Um, so I'm actually going to introduce um, my colleague, Eric, um, and he's going to ask a question. Eric, do you want to tell us where you are in the world and, and where you're originally from? Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Eric. I'm originally from Rutherford, New Jersey, but I'm living in Sweden and I've been here for the past 12 years. And I have a relatively simple question for you, uh, Congress, uh, Congressman Beyer. Um, Americans abroad, they face multiple obstacles that stateside Americans do not face in order for our voices to be heard. We can't show up uh, at our congressperson's district office since we live abroad. And even for those of us who are persistent advocates in working on building a relationship with our representatives, we find the biggest barrier is that Americans abroad tax issues are just not prioritized by representatives. Do you have any advice on how we can overcome these barriers so we can make this bill become a reality? Thank you. Yeah, Eric, actually I do have two suggestions. One is vote, please. Um, you know, I don't know if there's different opinions on how many Americans live overseas, somewhere between 3 million and 6 million. Again, anecdotally, I don't have the statistics in front of me. The last time they tried to include um, overseas Americans in the U.S. Census, uh, less than 100, less than 1 million actually signed up. And some of that may be because they want to stay off the out of the visibility of the IRS. Um, but then the other deal besides just voting is actually reaching out to the members of Congress. Um, I have, you know, if the if Americans overseas who vote in my election, not necessarily for me, but in my election, you have an address or a permanent residence or something like that, uh, last known residence in my eighth district of Virginia. But whether you're there or in Wichita or Sacramento, whatever, reach out to that member of Congress who represents, um, you know, Ami Barra in Sacramento and, and uh, Ron Estes in Wichita and talk to them about it. Um, it makes it much easier for me and for those of us on the Hill that are trying to get this passed if other members of Congress have heard from you about what the concern is. And uh, and not just, by the way, you send the letters, that's okay, you know, the emails, but members of Congress see very few of those emails. Uh, we all have so-called legislative correspondent or correspondents who bats all the abortion letters together and the gun letters together and the Israel letters together and, and answer them. Um, but if you make the phone call um, to the actual district itself, you're likely to get somebody like a district uh, director. Uh, mine's a great guy named Noah Simon. And often it comes from them right to the member of Congress. So, so somehow you have to get that member's attention. And then if you come back to the States and can spend a day in Washington, you know, uh, make that appointment. Um, we have delegations coming in all day, maybe 20 a day. And I'll probably meet with five or six in a given day um, that talk everything from breast cancer to, you know, child education to America's overseas. And, you know, somebody sits in my office for half an hour and and educates me about the issue, I'm much more likely to be able to ready to vote for. Yeah, one of the things, uh, just to add to that, um, I think I, I hear increasingly from a lot of people who just feel like the only way out is to renounce their citizenship. And um, the thing I, I remind people is that Look, our issue is no different from any other issue or advocacy work that is going on. 
um, we're unfortunately having to compete against hundreds of other different issues. I mean, you, you look at like abortion rights or uh, gun reform or anything, you know, all of those are screaming for attention, right? Um, so I just remind people that our issues are no different from other issues. It just has to be about communicating and having our voices be heard. Yeah, and but it is an important issue. The the other thing which I I feel compelled to point out too is uh, that, I, and I'm discouraged by how many Americans don't feel their government works very well anymore. Um, and our, our lack of a speaker for the last three weeks is is a classic part of that. But also an electoral college where um, again and again, we keep having people who don't win the popular vote be elected president or a U.S. Senate where 30 percent of the country elects 70 percent of the senators. And they tend to be, um, you know, from you know, more rural, for example, older. Uh, just the, there, there are a lot of sort of structural challenges. Um, we keep pushing for ranked choice voting in multi-member districts in the House so that we stop electing the people on the far, far edges um, who, as we've seen, can, can really slow everything down. Because we're trying to get people that are will work together across the aisle in a bipartisan way and actually get things done. Um, but th these are larger challenges of, of democracy in the 21st century. And, uh, and you are our inability to make a government that functions ever better holds back good legislation that would affect you. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I, I have um, Jeff here who wants to ask a question about um, FATCA specifically. Um, so Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us where you are and, and where you're from. So hi, my name is uh, Jeff Spider. Uh, I live in France. I've lived in France for about 25 years now, on and off, uh, and I vote for California. So uh, in the decade since FACA's passage, it's been well documented that FACA has caused tremendous harm for Americans overseas. Why hasn't anything been done to help Americans overseas, either to reform the FACA or, for me, better yet, repeal the FACA? Uh, why hasn't Congress gone after the real criminals who are evading taxes rather than casting such a wide border net that prevents Americans abroad from being able to open a bank account in their country of residence? For example, in France, there are banks that refuse to open accounts for Americans or will close the accounts. So. Did yeah. you catch that? Sorry, Jeff. I had I, I, I did, yeah. And, and Jeff, I, I heartily agree with you. And again, um, I don't want to make excuses, but we have to somehow get to 218 votes in the House and 60 plus votes in the Senate and a president that will sign it. Uh, we've had a FATCA reform bill um, year after year that never, not even doesn't make it out of committee, never even gets a hearing on committee. Um, the last the last Congress I chaired the Joint Economic Committee, and we did actually did a hearing just on the tax challenges of American living overseas in an attempt to, to bring attention to it. Uh, we just have to um, we have to be relentless. We have to just continue fighting for it. And I would, I would wholly support um, FATCA repeal. Probably more likely is a, yeah, a FATCA um, re modernization. You know, cleaning it up, but in a way that addresses specifically the issues that you're talking about. What it does to the average, you know, middle income American, and it's wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I just wanted to check what your time is like, um, Congressman, because um, could we do a few I, questions from sure, the sure, Q&A? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm just going to take it from the top, like I explained at the beginning all. So I'm sorry if we we don't get to everyone's questions. Um, but the top question here is, um, Congressman Beyer, what would you recommend as the two or three key issues that Americans abroad should use to get the attention of our senators and representatives um, the on the double tax burden in the U.S. imposes on its citizens abroad? Um, I, I don't want to be too repetitive, but you know, members, um, people who run for office tend to be pleasers. I mean, there are exceptions, <laughs> but most of us, you know, uh, want, first of all, almost everybody there 
there are exceptions, is there because they want to make the country better and stronger. And most people there have a real service orientation. So th that individual outreach, um, even by the way, sometimes a handwritten letter to the member of Congress rather than one of the 10,000 emails um, will have a bigger impact. And then any chance that you have to meet with him or her, um, again, will elevate the discussion. I'd love to be able to, to take our Americans Abroad um, Act and have 100 members of Congress co-sponsoring it. It's one of the things that we work on you know, day in and day out. The more co-sponsors we have, the more likely it is that it will be included in another bill or in a perfect world, I, I haven't mentioned this yet, there's another way to get a bill passed, and that's, quote unquote, on suspension. And that means the chairman of the committee likes it. We think it can get two out of three votes on the House floor, 290 votes out of 435. And then they just put it on the floor, usually Monday night at 630, as people are flying in from around the country. And two or three people will vote against it, and 400 will vote for it. There's this interesting phenomenon when people see something that's truly bipartisan, they relax and stop fighting about it uh, and I'll just vote for it. And that would be the perfect world to, to approach it. And then we don't have to apply it to, to, to something bigger. By the way, something like FACA that would have a, a fiscal impact almost certainly can't go on suspension. But the Americans abroad, which has no fiscal impact, uh, certainly can. And uh, please call your congressman and ask him to co-sponsor the bill. That also, by the way, the specific ask, rather than just telling your story, um, we know the bill number um, and the, the co-sponsors and you say, please co-sponsor this bill. And sometimes people will say, hey, how come you didn't co-sponsor this really interesting bill about breast cancer? And I said, because I didn't know about it, because uh, there are thousands of bills to get put in. Um, somebody's got to let me know or my, my lead staff know that this is a, an issue of concern. And then um, 99 times out of 100, we will go add our name to the list and help push it towards final passage. That's really helpful to understand and know. I think that a lot of people on this call probably don't understand the nuances of, of yeah. how to pass a bill. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Rebecca, if one of the things that comes out of this call is 10 more Democrats and Republicans um, co-sponsor the bill, that will have made a big difference. 100%. That also helps me when I go to Mike Kelly, um, chair of the tax subcommittee, or Jason Smith from Missouri, who's chair of the overall Ways and Means Committee, and say, hey, Mr. Chairman, look, there are 50 members of Congress, by Dems and Republicans, who support this bill. Put it on the floor. You know, let, let, let's make sure we have a vote. The Senate's a different deal, and we can talk about that. But first, let's get it out of the House. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, the, the next most popular question is, is there any effort underway to change the PFIC rules to make it easier to invest in foreign mutual funds? Um, not that I know of, but, and, but I know that uh, Dylan McGowan, who's on the call with us, my, my lead staffer on this, uh, had took notes about that and is trying to drill down with Congressional Research Service to see what can be done. Uh, but, I, but I know it is really important. Yeah. Um, I will I will definitely follow up with Dylan on that one because we get a lot of questions of people not being able to invest for their futures, whether that's in a retirement account or even a basic savings account. It's very difficult, whether that's stateside or um, abroad. Yeah. By um, the way, it, interesting how some of these uh, I, I had a I've heard the story three or four times, but a, a, a couple Swiss couple you know, maybe Swiss American who lived in Switzerland for a number of years and owned a house there with a mortgage. And uh, and they moved back to the United States and immediately lost their mortgage because the Swiss bank said, we're not giving you a mortgage when you live in the United States, e even though they wanted to keep the house in Switzerland. And then, of course, no U.S. bank wanted a loan with an, with an asset with collateral that was across an ocean. You know, just uh, really unfortunate stuff because of these laws. And it's becoming more and more as as more people move abroad as well. Um, it's becoming more and more of an issue for people, right? Because um, we've just seen a huge spike in people wanting to leave um, the United States for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but 
partially because of the political environment and, and that it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on it's it's i've i've heard lots of people republican democrat who talk about moving abroad um and uh you know but people still move abroad for all different kinds of reasons but that's something i've noticed that's changed and shifted in specifically in the last few years and rebecca let me just emphasize too that th this is not a partisan issue is not Dems versus Republicans. So this is something we should all be working on together, which also makes it really important to register to vote wherever your U.S. address is um, and, and to participate in the political process. And then please don't worry, the, 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 the voter registrars and the IRS do not talk to each other. <laughs> There's no linkage in between. So you're not going to be called for jury duty because you, you registered in Peoria. Yeah, totally. And I'll, I'll be making a, a big plug for people to remember to register to vote. But um, just to so that I can make a plug now, our, um, the best place for people to register to vote if they're living abroad is votefromabroad.org. Um, it makes it super, super easy for people who are living overseas who have a foreign address. Um, I, I registered this year and it only took me five minutes. So I really it, like encourage people to do that. And, and more and more states are sending ballots to every registered voters, um, Oregon, Washington, California, um, Colorado, or like Virginia. If you've ever once requested an absentee ballot, you're on the permanent absentee ballot list and they will do it. You don't have to go through the process every time. They will send it to you automatically. Yeah, I, I vote in Ohio and unfortunately they don't do that. Um, so I have to register every year. Um, but some, some states, people are really lucky. They, they, they are kept on the roll, but, uh, we generally encourage people to register every year just to be sure. Right. Um, so I'll, I'm going to do, do you, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And then I've, I've, I've a noon appointment, noon Eastern daylight time. Okay. I'll make it away. actually, it's not so much of a question. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to read it anyway. It says, I worry about my children who are dual citizens have never lived or worked in the U S they have, they will be required to file U S tax returns because they happen to be American. The best advice I can give them is to give up their U S citizenship, which, co which costs around $2,300. I can't see how this is fair to them and regret giving them American citizenship when they were born. All I can offer is sympathy. I understand. And there will certainly be times when the best thing for them in their lives is to give up the citizenship, the U.S. citizenship. But but that's a sad thing. Um, it's, a, it's a special privilege to be part of the, the United States, and you hate to give it up. But um, and, and I, I never want to encourage people to do that. But sometimes it's it's the only thing that works. And to the extent that we can make these laws better, uh, hopefully we'll reduce the situations where that's necessary. Yeah, I would just say that we're currently running a campaign asking for people to submit their comments. Uh, the State Department is actually in the process of reducing the cost to renounce. And um, a lot of people are looking at renouncing because of these tax problems. And so we really want to point out that people won't be looking at renouncing if we fix the core problem, which is fix the tax problems. Um, okay, but absolutely. yeah, I, I didn't mean to end on a on a low note there, um, but I, I just want to say a heartfelt thank you so much for your time, Congressman. I really appreciate your your support for the American abroad community. It's um, it's amazing. <laughs> Rebecca, one last thought too. Sometimes in nature and in politics, things happen slowly, 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 and then very quickly. Uh, and there are really major sea changes. So let's hope that this is something that um, one day soon we will turn the corner and it will happen quickly. I hope so. I think everyone on this call hopes so as well. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so luck. much. We'll Thank keep you. working for you. That, that, thanks for helping me round up partners on the Hill. Oh, always, always happy to. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So um, on, on that note, basically what I'm going to do now, everybody, is just kind of quickly walk you through. I know that we're over time, but hopefully you can stick around for another 
five minutes or so. Um, I'm just going to quickly walk you through the process of how to contact your members of Congress in order to ask them to co-sponsor on the bill. So it's actually just three really easy steps. The first one is you need to find your House representatives' contact information. The second one is to call or email them. And then the third is to tell us that you called or emailed them. <laughs> so um, actually, uh, Congressman Byer gave a lot of really good insight in terms of how to get their attention. So totally take that on board. Um, this is just a kind of recommendation in terms of like, if you're looking to do um, either the bare minimum or kind of try to um, uh, just make sure that you're you're being recognized and that you've put in your request in a formal capacity, whether that's by email or phone call, everything is logged. So um, those are those messages are logged. And even if congressional staff turn over, that information is still in the database that they can go back and look at in the past. So it's always really great to either call or or email um, or do both. So you'll go to congress.gov in order to find your member. You'll want to grab your last U.S. address or your U.S. voting address, or if you haven't lived in the U.S. before, your parents' last U.S. address. Um, and then you'll look for your house reps' contact information based on your U.S. address. So for me, I just screenshotted this. It's um, Joyce Beatty, and um, there's the contact information. So there's the, the phone number for the congressional office. And then if you click on the contact button, you uh, it then takes you to the contact form on their website. Uh, and when you call, um, here's a draft script. So basically, you can have this in front of you and you can have it open and read it uh, word for word, or you can customize it. The more you customize it, probably the better or personalize it. And um, you'll just want to ask if they will co-sponsor on the bill. Um, some tips I recommend calling during Washington, D.C. office hours. So that's normally about 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time on weekdays um, in order to increase your chances of actually getting through to a human. Um, after if you try to call and it goes to voicemail, um, just hang up and try again. Um, most of the time, if you call around three times, about three different times during the day, you can normally get through to a person. Um, but if you don't, then go ahead and leave a voicemail. Um, if you don't get through and you want some help, then you can email us and we'll do our best to try to help you out. Um, if you're having trouble with calling the US or you don't call the US very often, most of the time you can call through the internet in order to reduce your costs, in order to make that international call. Um, for example, you can um, add $5 or the equivalent of on Skype and you have like something like 300 minutes to call the US. So it's pretty reasonably priced in order to call. Um, and then once you've done that, email us to confirm that you called or emailed. Um, tell us your rep's name, the name of the person you spoke to, and what they said. It's always really helpful for us to track how well our campaign is going and to see how many people were contacted and then the results of how many co-sponsors we get on the bill. Um, and that's it. It's as simple as that. So like if all of the hundreds of people on this webinar right now contacted their members of Congress, as as Congressman Byer said, we will we would probably get um, a, a, a handful more of people to co-sponsor. So please, please, it, your your follow up action here is to um, contact your member of Congress, your House rep. Oh, and just to clarify, you do not. Um, you are only contacting your House representative for this, not the Senate, because the bill hasn't been introduced on the Senate side. So just um, it's a really easy one phone call. You don't have to call your senators, just your House rep. That's it. One call, one email. That's it. OK, so just to kind of wrap up here, um, we have a number of tax events coming up, both in person and online. Uh, so one tomorrow uh, in France. So anybody from France here, um, you can uh, join our webinar on investment strategies for Americans in France on Thursday. 
Uh, you can actually meet me in person in Alicante, Spain. Uh, we'll be there and doing a drinks and tax chat. Um, do save the date in particular. I want to highlight um, we're going to be hosting a webinar on how to set up an online IRS account, which is the same online account in order to then also uh, access your online social security account with ID.me, which is the company that sets those up. Um, we'll also be doing some in-person events in Australia in December. So six small actions that you can take to help improve the tax system for Americans abroad. Um, I, I I cannot emphasize enough. I, I I do talk to people who feel like their vote doesn't matter. Every vote from abroad matters. Register to vote in U.S. elections at votefromabroad.org. It is so critical for a number of reasons. It doesn't matter if you vote in the reddest of red states or the bluest of blue states. Whenever people from abroad vote, those votes are uh, counted in the statistics. And then when we go to meet with members of Congress, uh, when we go to Washington, D.C., we always go in and share the number of people who voted from abroad in their district or their state. Every vote matters. And we've had so many offices say, oh, I had no idea that there were so many of my constituents living abroad. And they take those numbers very seriously in order to prioritize our issues. And we talked a lot about how we're not prioritized. So in order to get prioritized, we need to show them that we exist. And we, and we do that by voting because we're not counted in the census. And uh, we, you know, there's a lot of information that we lack about Americans abroad, but this is one piece of data that makes it very, very helpful for us to be prioritized and stand out. So please, please vote from abroad. Um, I, I've walked you through how to contact your representative to co-sponsor on the bill. I've also recommended that you read the tax report that we put out last year. And if you're not already a Democrats Abroad member, it's free to join. You can join by going to democratsabroad.org slash join. Um, you can also sign up for our tax mailing list. Uh, so you might be a member already and you might be on the generic Democrats Abroad email list. You can also sign up for our tax specific mailing list. So you're kept up to date on our tax advocacy work. Um, and also our campaigns um, and, and information. So uh, finally, you can also volunteer for the Taxation Task Force by going to the link on the screen there. Um, if you are uh, voting in any of these states or if you're from any of these states, so Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Utah, or Virginia, this year is a critical election year for you. Um, it's a little late to register. However, if you are registered to vote or if you have uh, haven't received your ballot yet, or if you haven't sent it back yet, you should send it back. If you need any help, we have volunteers on standby. You can email at GOTV, which stands for get out the vote at votefromabroad.org for assistance. They're watching that inbox. Like you'll get an email back within the hour. Um, people are very, very happy to help you with voting in these critical elections. Um, and also I know some um, states will roll your uh, your vote over from year to year, but if you vote in a state like like mine in Ohio, they don't. They clear it every year, so you have to register every year. We do recommend just to be safe to register to vote in January every year. Votes start in March next year. Mar March uh, is when the first primary takes place for the presidential election. Twenty twenty four is a critical critical year for voting. So set a reminder on January 1st to register to vote. All you need to do is go to votefromabroad.org and register to vote on January 1st. That way it's done. It, you're, you can clear it from your mind and then you'll get the information that you need to vote and you'll get your ballot as and when it becomes available. I think that is it. Um, so please, please don't forget to fill in the feedback form. Um, we uh, are are now done, but I'll I'm happy to stick around for a little bit um, to chat to people. And uh, yeah, please, please fill in the feedback form. We'd love to hear what you thought of the webinar and uh, any any feedback that you have for us. Um, so. Again, there's our contact information. Uh, if you want to email the Taxation Task Force, the email is taxationtf at democratsabroad.org. Thank you again, everybody, for attending. I really appreciate your time and um, have a good uh, day, morning, evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you.